Uh, we're doing, I can't even remember the date. April 21st, we're doing the ball game night. I have tickets. They're $5. Um, and a lot of that, the $5 is going back into giveaways. Um, we're going to do put together all the other pieces and just really from the church. So if you want to take some tickets, um, I just need to know who's got what so that we can try to understand how many are coming. The other piece is on Wednesday nights at 6.30 here, because um, we're launching in a new series called Draw the Circle. Uh, for the next five weeks, we're going to have a Bible study that will go along with it. If you want to be a part of that, it's video-driven. I'm going to be leading it here. Uh, they are also i got to remember the times now. 10 o'clock Wednesday morning at Bypass Campus. And is it Tuesday or Thursday? Thursday at 4 at our River Street Campus. Um, and Steve's doing the Wednesday morning. Andrew's doing the Thursday afternoon. So each pastor's taking a group and each pastor's taking a campus that we're going to be hanging out at and doing that. So if you want to be a part of that, uh, we'll have some books and it'll help us just progress through that. Now let me just tell you, part of this story, or, or this book, uh, this is the book that this series is based off of, The Circle Maker, um, is prominent for Kay and I, and uh, probably even made it even more so for me. Kay was reading this prior to us coming to St. Mark. Uh, we, our prayer had been to be back into full-time ministry. And so I'm going to share parts of the bits and stories from this um, as to how God was moving us. And um, earlier this week, I did, not, I did not know this existed. Uh, Kay pulled out her prayer journal uh, from this. And so I knew some of how, how this impacted us, and then she shared with me her prayer journal um, about it. So there's a lot for me in this. And I told somebody earlier, I said, I'm not sure that I can unpack all of it at one time. A, because I don't know the emotional side of me can do that. Because we weren't in a great, we, were, we knew we were called. We knew what we, what we wanted to see happen in our lives. And so uh, seeing that fulfilled is interesting. And how you learn to pray uh, through some of those pieces. So this is a lot about prayer. Uh, and how we talk. It's interesting, we talked the last two weeks about communicating with other people, very particularly uh, with our spouses and those major relationships. And now we're going to go to the piece that is vital for us to communicate with God of how that is played out and how that looks out. So we're still doing communication, it's just communicating with God. There was a Gentlemen, during what would be called the intertestamental period, between the, where the Old Testament ends and where the New Testament begins, his name is Honey. He was a preacher or a priest in the Jewish temple. And Israel was experiencing this great drought. And we know today water has always been precious. We talk, I've talked about it a lot. That what is Israel? It is a dry, rocky place. Water is vital to them. When they, it's the reason they named wells, that's why they fought over wells. That's why those wells are still named. And he had enough faith that he was going to pray for rain. He went and drew a circle out in the desert and started to pray. And the people started to celebrate because it started to sprinkle. And as he was praying, he goes, God, I didn't pray for a light rain. God, I prayed for you for rain to fill this land and nourish it. And the story goes that the drops got like as big as eggs falling out of the sky. I do not want to get hit by one of those. They literally had so much rain that it were flash floods in the area. And he continued to just pray. Many times we don't have enough faith to pray hard things and big things. 
The story we're going to talk about today is an answer to fulfilled promises that people had been praying for and that God had promised long ago. We're going to tell part of the story of Joshua. We're going to tell Joshua and Jericho. But think back about what this looked like. At the end of Deuteronomy, Moses dies. Standing on the mountain of Moab, looking into the promised land. God tells him, he goes, I promised this not only to you, but to Abraham, to Isaac, and Jacob. I don't know if God said, unfortunately, Moses, you don't get to go in. And he did tell him, you don't get to go, just as I told you. There had been 40 years of wandering in the desert. And Moses dies there on Moab. Joshua becomes, I can't imagine what this had to be like is now the leader of Israel. I was trying to think in our own country what it had to be like to follow somebody of that great of a leader. And not only that, that you're going to lead these people into a place they've never been. And that you and only one other person said, well, let's go. And they sent the spies in. They go in to the promised land. They a couple of kings who struggle and are no more. Then the first big city that they come to is Jericho. To walk around it would have been several miles around. There were two different layers of walls around Jericho. One of them is about eight feet high and it's really, really thick. And then there was the inner wall and it's over 12 feet tall. And again, really wide. You could have driven chariots around both of them on top. I hadn't seen anything like that. And that's what they walk into. And God has said, go take it. I don't know about you, but at that moment, I would have started to pray. So listen at how what happens as they go through it. The um, first piece is in Joshua chapter 5, verses starting with verse 13. Now Joshua was near Jericho. He looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. Joshua went up to him and asked, Are you for us or for our enemies? Neither, he replied. But as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. Now remember, I just told you who was the leader of Israel. He's the leader of the Lord's army as far as he's concerned. And all of a sudden, Joshua realizes there is somebody higher than him standing in front of him. This guy's professed to be directly from God, from Yahweh. Whoo! Then Joshua fell face down to the ground in reverence and asked him, What message does my Lord have for his servant? The commander of the Lord's army replied, Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. And Joshua did so. And now the gates of Jericho were securely barred because of the Israelites. No one went out. And no one came in. Then the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have delivered Jericho into your hands, along with its kings and its fighting men. Now, I don't know about you. Now, I, I get and I grasp calling. But if I was Joshua at this moment, I'm like, You delivered it to me, it's still there, and they're all inside. They may outnumber us. I'm not sure it's delivered yet, God. I don't know about you, but I'd have been scared. And I don't get scared easy. Then there's this piece of faith, right? 
And then the angel of the Lord starts to lay out a plan. And we know this plan. We've heard this plan. Then the Lord said, I've delivered Jericho into your hands. The king and all of its men. That's verse 2. Verse 3 says, March around the city with all our men. Do this for six days. Have seven priests carry the trumpets and the rams and horns in front of the ark. And on the seventh day, march around the city seven times with the priests blowing the trumpets. And when you hear them, sound a song. Sound a long blast of the trumpets and have the whole army give a loud shout. And then the wall of the city will collapse and the army will go up, everyone straight into it. It doesn't tell us that the men, as they start this in the next verses, they st- tells us that they encamp around it and for six days, one lap of peace. I don't know. I'd have been scared because they're just marching in silence. There were arrowmen. There were spearmen. There was every part of that army of Jericho watching. Wonder what in the world are they doing? Everything says cut off the water and do all of these things. Bring out the battering ramps. And they're just marching around. Not saying a thing. I would have struggled because it told them to march in silence, by the way. Some of you know me well enough to laugh at that. It's okay. One of these points you're going to love. I would have been in prayer. This would have been a time where God has laid something in front of you that's bigger than anything you can imagine. This is one of those moments we typically are glad to run to prayer. And listen at 15 and 17 and then verse 21. Hold on, I've got to move my note. It's over here covering up my scriptures. Then on the seventh day, they've walked around for six times. That's what happens between verse 6 and 15. And on the seventh day, they got, got up at daybreak and marched around the city seven times in the same manner. Except that on the, that day, they circled the city seven times. The seventh time around, when the priest sounded the trumpet blast, Joshua commanded the army to shout, For the Lord has given you the city, and the city and all that is in it are to be destroyed, are to be devoted to the Lord. Only Rahab and the prostitute and all who were with her in her house shall be spared because she had hid the spies. All of a sudden when that happens, the walls crumble. And over 100,000 strong march into Jericho. What do you think of when you hear that story? What is it that comes to mind? I'm like, how does that happen? God. I'm like, would I have had enough faith to just march around? Or would I have been trying to put... I've been my own sensibility. And Joshua was a great warrior. God had given him that gift and talent. But I've been trying to put my own ways of coming and solving the problem of Jericho. Because the rest of the promised land, you had to go through here. To proclaim the promise that God had given to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, and to Moses. Jericho had to fall. I don't know that I see something quite as Jericho, but there are things that I know that my life can't grow from unless they fall away. They stand between me and what I'm doing. When's the first time you... What happens when something goes wrong? What's your first reaction? Whose fault? For me, one of the things that happens, this is one of the, even when we don't pray, it's like, who I got to get on my knees now. I'm like, we should have been on our knees sooner. 
we have to learn. If you're doing fill in the blanks, we have to learn what to circle. We have to learn what it means to have something circled in prayer. To draw. Most of y'all, have any of y'all ever been to a Wednesday night prayer meeting? In the Baptist church, they had them all the time. Or at least most of them did. It sounds like a body part swap prayer list. Pray for Aunt Ethel's knees. Somebody's liver. and Just on and on it goes. And those are God-sized issues in our own individual lives, aren't they? I think about health issues. I know when my father had hepatitis, that was a God-sized task. But sometimes when we start praying, we don't pray things big enough. I would tell you that how and what you pray for, the size of what you pray for, tells me a lot about the size of your God. When's the last time that what you were praying for glorified God? When's the last time that you realized you were praying for something that was bigger than anything you could imagine? That if you saw God do that, there was no way you could get the credit, a doctor could get the credit, a teacher could get the credit, that the only credit could be given could be given to God. Hmm. God-sized prayers versus ours. And I will tell you, I've had in my own life some of those limits. I was challenged by this even about how I was praying for this campus, for this. God, take care of this situation. Learn to draw a circle that's big enough that it's a God-sized task and not a you-sized task. To tell you how much I was challenged in my own space. When I was here Thursday, I walked through our rooms and prayed prayers that I hadn't prayed yet. They were big. Saturday, I asked Kay, I said, will you come with me? And we're going to walk this place. I did not walk a circle around the building. I walked a circle out in the parking lot. And if God answers all of those prayers, there will be nothing that any of us can say other than look what God did. I was determined and determined to continue to pray that set of prayers over this place. I imagine that Abraham, it took a long time to see all of that answered. But man, what it ought to look like when I start praying God-sized task versus John-sized task. What's your prayers look like? What are you drawing a circle around? This is the piece about us communicating. When you start drawing that circle, it's about learning to talk in circles. And y'all go, John, you do that great. Yes. But it's learning about with that circle and it. And if that's what you need, you need a literal circle. Honey drew a circle in the dirt. Take a piece of rope, a piece of chalk, or understand the circle that you have. Because at that moment, it's about you and God talking to each other. In the movie Fireproof, it says, go get in your closet. Find a place so that you can understand that you can talk to God. Because learning to pray in circles means that I'm going to learn to talk to Him. 
when I was reading the book, Kay and I had been on a journey and I don't guess all of it was wilderness. There was a lot of it though that was. It was a six year journey from stepping down and at First Baptist Lancaster to knowing that God had used us through hospice and he was using us as we were serving part time but knew that John, John wasn't made to be split-minded. It doesn't work well for me. I'm already ADD and you try to give me two things like that. It just doesn't work great. And our prayer was to be back in full-time ministry. When I flipped through the story of Jericho, and there's Kay's note up the side. And John a full-time ministry job. And we drew the circle. It's funny, as I was reading her polka-dotted, did you intentionally have that prayer list with the circles on that side? Okay. Uh, that makes sense. She wrote about how she had learned to ask God. She was already thanking God for the job that was going to happen. And she asked me, she goes, this, I'm going to change how I'm praying. I said, good, I'm going to keep praying for a job. <laughs> I wasn't reading a book. But we started praying for a God-sized task. You have to remember, we were in the midst of when this happened. So I, I being interviewed by a Methodist church of changing denominations. And some of you go, you still got a lot of Baptist in you, yep. <laughs> you know what she wanted to do? I drove and circled around St. Mark I don't know how many times because she was afraid it was Wednesday night there were people there. She wasn't going to walk. Because it, for us, it was huge. It was a changing of everything we knew and we understood and it looked like God was calling us in one way. And I would say today that we needed to draw that circle even bigger. We needed clarity in that moment. We did. But we had to learn to draw that circle bigger even than that. And I think we have prayed a whole lot bigger than that around it. But God was moving as we were talking in circles. As we were learning to go, all right, God. Kay had in real big, bold letters, does God want us to become Methodist? But what we promised we would do when we committed to follow Christ was that we would follow Him. And so learning to pray bigger circles and go, God, I, I don't like going over here. But sometimes I don't know that Joshua was completely ready to be follow Moses. I can't imagine following George Washington in our country. But that's what this was like for us. When we start praying God's house prayers, He gives us the power and the ability to go places we don't think we can go. How are you at talking inside your circle? Because I will promise you, God will never answer the prayers we never say. 100% of the time. Because we didn't ask them. But what will it do when we start putting ourselves in front of him consistently and praying and talking to him? The last piece and, um, is, is we need to allow God to work inside our circles. You say, John, I don't even know how to draw a bigger circle. And how do I know what God is asking me to pray about? One of the things that is clear to me, when you do the part before, when you start talking to God on a regular basis, that God will start to align your heart with His desires and His wishes. Because when you allow the God to work on, the, on you in that time, He will aim you to God's size task in that ability. You've got to allow God to work on your heart. When you're praying. 
And it's got to last for a long time. But are you allowing, are you, I'm afraid sometimes we just don't pray. I mean, I told you I was challenged today in my own self about how I was praying. But I'm afraid we just don't pray. We don't take the time. But over the next 40 days, we're going to encourage you to pray and to write down and to keep a record of what you're praying for. The, um, at our house, we've used a jar where we, it's a praise jar. We do it so that you, you put in where God answered prayers. You can look back over the year and see how God has answered your prayers. One of the most things that I was most moved by in my life is, um, I'll tell you how long ago this has been, I could go into a Winn-Dixie there in Simpsonville. And I ran into, I don't know, I wondered if he slept, Mr. Maynard slept at Winn-Dixie. Because every time I was there, I would see him. And he didn't live far from the Winn-Dixie. But he had a little notebook and about like this, and that's why they're, matter of fact, they're at Oliver campus today. And Mr. Maynard would look at me. I remember him first doing this to my father. And he would be talking to my dad, and both of them liked to talk. And I was like, I understand how my kids feel. I'm like, are they ever going to end? You know, my ice cream's melting up here. I got butter pecan. But I remember Mr. Maynard asking my dad, how can I pray for you? And as I got a little older and Kay and I were married, I would run into Mr. Maynard there at Winn-Dixie and he'd pull out that little notebook. You know, I do not know how he did this. He would remember the last time he had seen me and what I had asked him to pray about. I probably do know because he had been praying over it. He would ask me, and sometimes I would tell him, God answered this prayer, and he'd get his little pen out, and he would mark that one off. And he goes, what else can I add to my prayer list, John? When Mr. Maynard died, I would have loved to have seen the inside of the house, because I bet there were, his kids were going, what are all, well, they knew what the notebooks were. How many there had to be? Because I saw him do it year after year and day after day. And so what we're asking you to do is to take a notebook, look around, if, find where somebody's not sitting and take theirs. Start writing down your prayer request over these next 40 days. When you're taking your time and you're praying over them, a verse of Scripture comes to mind, jot it down up under it. And allow this to be your guide for the next 40 days of praying. Pray God-sized task. Not just a you size task. I know something I pray very regularly. I pray for the right people to be in Hannah and JC's lives, for my daughter in law and son in law that will come. That's a God sized task. I am going to write down the specifics of what I prayed yesterday in mine and how I ask him to answer them for this place I'm going to write down some other things I'm going to write down some specific names people who don't know the Lord I'm going to pray for them and that's one of the things I do regularly but I'm going to write them down because how you pray and how often you pray is a testament of your faith do I have a little bitty God that I can only trust with little things? Or do I have, truly have a God that's big enough to save me for eternity? Because if He can do that, He can handle any prayer you can give Him. You pray in little bitty task, you pray in God-sized task. Hmm. How you pray and when you pray. And I would say what you pray is a testament of your faith in the God, creator, savior, and he who comes is a resurrection and a life. How are you praying today? How will you pray for the next 40 days? We'll talk a lot about that piece 
in the weeks that come. I'm going to pray for you, challenge you to pick up and start praying for 40 days. Um, we'll take our offering. If you're visiting with us, all we ask is that you put your connection card in the plate. Um, we're glad you're here. If you're, this is your place you call home, you worship, we do expect you to give. That's part of how we are as disciples. Let me pray for you. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for challenging me to pray bigger this week and for the days that lie ahead. Lord, I thank you that you could see and fulfill the promises of Joshua through Jericho and the walk into the promised land. Lord, may we be praying God's size prayers. And Lord, may your spirit move as we find ourselves on our knees. But Father, I thank you that we can come to you and call on you because you never grow weary and you do hear us. Thank you, Father, for your son, Jesus. Amen.